in Hong Kong Film sharing around the idea of whether or not our national identity was always defined by money. And we've heard this a lot, right? That Singaporeans over here, they are very pragmatic, they're focused upon money. But you know, when Hong Kong Film began to talk about that, there's one thing that I didn't begin to reflect, and it's true. If I look at my Singaporeanness, or why is it I'm proud of becoming part of Singapore? Or why is it we're doing this whole lecture series, right? Really for, I guess, our love for this country. Um, in doing so over here, I don't know, being, having the highest GDP in the, in the world, right? Or at least among the, uh, the, the developed countries over here, really is not something where um, it occurs to me. As he began to talk about this, what happened was that I took that first question, right? And began to bring it out to different sector leaders, right? and I spoke to three individuals from the MTI. What was interesting over here was that they were all citing this particular example as something that they are currently struggling with. And when I spoke to the arts groups, right, these are your theatre groups in Singapore, they also raised wet markets and supermarkets to be essentially the epitome or analogy of essentially what we're struggling with. Our trade finance, our shipping, our manufacturing, as far as high-end manufacturing is concerned, right, is really making a lot. And then you have other areas, right, uh, in retail, F&B, that are genuinely struggling. Um, a lot of businesses, and I never thought about this before, that focus on nostalgia, you know, that make the Singapore t-shirts, that, you know, do, that focus on Singapore film, they too also make no money, right? They do so for the passion of things over here, but if you really look behind it, right, the business just cannot scale. No one truly wants to buy Singapore nostalgia, right? It is not an exportable commodity, it doesn't sell very well, right? And at the end of the day itself, right, if you look at that, people are doing it surely for passion. So MTI might look at that and says, so now we have a problem. Because we have, let's say, this you know, range of work, which is essentially domestic focus, right? But we know that our money comes entirely from exports, right? And in the exports over here, therefore, if I have limited talent or limited people there, where therefore do I train them and where do I allocate them? Because if I start allocating them in one particular way over another, then yes, I'm going to start losing certain things. And the struggle over here is really within wet markets. And what they explained was this. Supermarkets are really the way to go. They are more efficient, they are more clean, right? And they actually are cheaper. The most uh, common misconception is that you go over to a wet market and you buy you know, a slab of pork or vegetables, whatever the case, that it will actually be cheaper than NTUC. It's not. NTUC is clearly about 15% right, uh, cheaper than actually any, any wet market in Singapore. And in going there itself and buying it, right, you will find then what the hell? I mean, if it's cleaner, if it's cheaper, if it's there, then why don't we go about doing it? And what the artist would then say is that, but once you do that, right, you lose Singaporeanness. You see, the strange thing itself about wet markets, right, is that wet markets are supermarkets with relationships. Communities form within wet markets, right? And as they do so over here, right, there's a, there's a multitude of stories that will happen, right, as a result of the wet market being where it is. Supermarkets, you realise, have no stories. There are no inherent relationships in them. And the only story you will find is basically the story that the business is essentially projecting to you, right? The story of Whole Foods Market, the story of basically cold storage and uh, NTC finest. And in doing so over here, you will find that the loss of story is something for the arts community that they find, you know, this is something which is unacceptable. Yeah. They draw this same relationship with food courts and with hawker centres. Food courts are essentially restaurants without relationships. Right there. There is no legacy behind them. So in doing so over here, NTI looks at that and it goes, okay. So setting up basically a wet market or allowing them to continue or setting up hawker centres allowing them to continue actually is a completely non-rational thing. Right? It is non-rational. Right? But for them, right, they're saying, but we have to keep it there. We have to keep it there because when we take this away, right, essentially you are completely removing the soul of a country. And they said that essentially in all the economic decisions that we make, at the heart of it, right, is really still a choice of identity. Who are we and what do we stand for? When a country becomes completely economically focused, right, and really just looks at where they can begin to allocate resources most efficiently, uh, you can begin to disenfr disenfranchise groups, right? Certain groups over here that are just disadvantaged in terms of your economic strategy. And in doing so over here, you're seeing basically the sunflower revolution and the umbrella revolution in Hong Kong as well as Taiwan. Um, and they're saying over here, these are not economic issues, these are identity issues. These are because that the country has chosen one particular group over another and has actually deprioritized one particular group. And in this case, unfortunately, they've alienated the youth. Right? So the youth will come out and then begin to start right, all sorts of social instability within the countries there. 
And NTI looks at that, right, in terms of, yes, the economic progress, but at the same time, right, preserving the social identity that really keeps us going. So they said, it's not our job to look at identity. But as human beings, we think about it all the time. I would like you to really plug in with this one because uh, we are now dealing with a real-life young lady here. Right? I made sure that um, I am going to tell this story exactly as she told it to me. This is about how she sees it. And what I asked her to do herself is I asked her to sit down with me and could you just tell me um, if you were to define yourself as a female, if you were to look at the female identity, right? one of the six main pillars or, you know, uh, yeah, six main pillars that really help you say, okay, therefore this is what makes me a woman. So we plotted it. In this case over here, this represents uh, where she stands in terms of what she finds to be important or unimportant. So then what happened over here was that um, after she graduated from junior college and she began to come out when she was working, um, she became a Christian. So in becoming a Christian over here, what's interesting is that um, this was suddenly an adoption of a new identity that came in for her, right? And this is something that she never grew up with. What she grew up with was the red line, right? But when she chose to become a Christian, right, she suddenly began to change. She go, oh dear, right? Do I now have to realign, right, what I've been practicing along the red line, right? And now look at the green line. Then I asked her to do this and I said, okay, so the, in the distance between this line you're looking at here and the red line, right, could you describe to me the emotional experience? So it was graduate from junior college. This is the red line. Two months later, became a Christian. Right. Three months later, she got attached. Right. And this is the first relationship right, uh, she has been in. And in this relationship she entered into, she got attached to a non-Christian boyfriend. Hey, don't judge. <laughs> and then I began to ask her, right, so why are you beginning to see this relationship right now? And when she entered into the relationship, what's interesting was that she then began to plot what happened. So therefore, if you have these particular emotions, right, between the green and the red, right, and then you take the blue, then what kind of emotions start coming up for you? Right. This is what she said. And generally, in terms of the whole experience, right, she called it just essentially confused. And I honestly think itself, every single young person, and if I'm not wrong, most of you are in your late 20s or 30s, um, you might have gone through similar patterns in your life. Right? And in your similar patterns over here, you'll find that stepping into you know, life, or starting to make choices for yourself, we always take on new identities. And each identity actually is a selection of priorities. Right? Every single identity is a selection of priorities. And we take on right, multiple identities at the speed at which she was doing, which means that it was graduate, Christian, get attached, right, and she kept moving at a particular speed, right, what she's creating for herself actually is a lot of the hard choices and dilemma. That in terms of the speed of growth of nations, uh, we have actually grown extremely fast, right, as fast as how this girl has graduated and basically became two, made two immense life choices, right, within the span of self six months or so. And in doing so, as she's began to grow that space, right, then it creates all that turmoil. In the same way, in a nation, 50 years, the world to first, three whole generations experiencing a different Singapore, different Singapore, different Singapore, across a whole range of issues, right? I'm not surprised you will get this. You get the same amount of confusion, and different generations and different points of view will start expressing different things. Some generations are going, oh my god, I'm so proud of Singapore. No, I hate Singapore. But essentially what they're doing over here is they're going through basically these emotional transitions. And the stories are very hard to catch. Because in that sense, right, how do we start doing this? How? If we were to work through an individual, right, I might have a semblance of how to begin to start with her. And a lot of it's about realigning her, you know, her, her choices, right, going through herself. So who are you? But if you want to take this, right, I'm not even plotting it across race and class. Right, and God knows where you live and things like that. I'm just plotting across generations, just simply by the demographic of when you were born. Right, you're already going to get a different experience and these big tensions that open up there. So Singapore, unlike right, a lot of other nations, right, and why that we are entering into what I believe to be an era, right, of really hard choices, is simply because of the idea that most countries, right, or at least a lot of them, have had the luxury of time to begin to grow. 
right? But the speed, and this speed is not going to slow down anytime soon, right? You're going to see more and more emotion. If we're going to stay dynamic and we're staying porous, then yes, new identities are going to keep coming in. Generations are going to be born, and they'll be born itself in a very different world. And when we do this, we are constantly going to go through this emotional stress, right, of experiencing a change in culture. This is another huge hard choice that uh, Mindef was expressing, right? And what they were saying themselves was essentially that, um, and don't I, I think more than half of you wouldn't even you weren't even born yet. Um, but the last refugee crisis that Singapore ever had was actually during the uh, Vietnam War, and there were these Vietnamese boat people that were coming into Singapore. And then the Rohingya Lebanese crisis happened, right? And uh, one of the upper ranks right, went over to the team and said, um, do you have a contingency plan for this? Right? And they come in, are we ready for this? What are we going to do? Right? So they asked and went to MFA, and MFA's decision was very clear. Singapore will never take refugees. No. Not a single one will land. Right? And then what happened was that these particular people in the military you felt immediately said, I never thought I would say this, but I genuinely was at a hard choice. Because I felt as a Singaporean, so what does it say about us? We're one of the wealthiest countries in the entire region. So what you're hearing over here is that the hard choice right, puts you in a space where it's a reflection of your identity. It's the same kind of hard choice you will have is that if your mother and your wife are drowning in the... <laughs> And you can only save one, right? <laughs> who will you save? And when you go and do this over here, notice it's a reflection of who you are. Right? And it's a sucky choice that you have to begin to make. Some of you may have watched this um, online, and this is uh, Ruth Chan's uh, TED piece, right? Uh, so she was speaking on TED, and she actually gave a talk, right, essentially about hard choices. And what came to a place over here was that Ruth was just saying that there's an invitation, right, in a hard choice, right? Not so much right, to find the reasons given to you, but we need to find reasons that are crafted by you. Almost all my life, I think up to the age of maybe 30s or so, right, um, I've always found myself in the dilemma of hard choices. And I was stuck because I didn't know who I could be or what I needed to be because everybody itself was somehow unhappy in one given way or another. So by the time itself, I hit my late 20s over here, I was always suicidal. So every hard choice that I met, I ran. Some option was always conveniently presented for me. I took it, and I ran. And what's interesting over there is that the character never ever grew because I was always listening to what was presented to me, not following right, a reason that was crafted by me. Right? And it was only until right, roughly around the age of, I think my very early 30s, right, when I really began to look at this as, what on earth is going on with your life? Surely, Right. You must begin to find something of value. And it was my mom right, that came to me and she sat me down one day. I was sitting in front of the TV and I was a complete shell. Right. And she came to me and she said, I want my son back. So whatever it is that you are going through in your life over here, I don't care. But I want my son back. Right. So find your voice, find yourself right, and come back. The hard choice will open up an impossibly large range of emotions for individuals, for institutions, for societies that will face them. Without understanding these emotions, right, we are likely to miss the opportunity the hard choices can bring for us as a people and as a nation. Right? And what you'll find over here is that the hard choice is not something that we actually have a lot of access to. If you truly yourself care right, and you listen, Singapore goes through hard choices on a daily to weekly basis. Leaders make a lot of these decisions, right? But I think it's time that citizens start to look at them too, right? Because there's opportunity for character right, in those bigger decisions. Uh, can I just see a show of hands? How many of you have already watched Inside Out? Uh, okay, good for you. There was a profound relationship that was discovered towards the end of the film around the relationship between uh, sadness and joy. Sadness I will build us the capacity to actually connect with other people because only in our sadness do we express vulnerability and our vulnerability to people therefore come right, and the community is formed. It is easy enough right, for us to look at hard choices and see this basically from an intellectual point of view. Right? Because goodness gracious, right, Singapore has tons of this stuff. Right? It's there. But there's not enough content to understanding so what goes on for us as people when we go through a hard choice. Emotions play out upon the facial expression. 
right? And if you begin to actually uh, track, right, or measure or see facial expressions, we we'll largely go into a few main expressions, right, this particular way, right? And these expressions right, are what we call key emotions, okay? Psychologists itself, I would then begin to tell you that uh, they debate between whether there are five key emotions or seven key emotions over here, but essentially itself, right, they're around five to seven, some people say four, okay? And for now, for the purpose of just uh, doing a nice easy two by two, right, we're gonna establish four more key emotions. Okay. So I'm gonna place these four key emotions there, but I need you to understand what's happening on this axis and what's happening on this axis. So fear and anger itself are high tension emotions, right? Emotions like sadness are low energy emotions, right? So what we're seeing over here is that we're seeing basically the first axis around what we call tension and relaxed. Okay? In the Singapore context over here, what it would look like is high stakes and low stakes. Job security is a high stakes issue. Right? Immigration is a high stakes issue. Education is a high stakes issue. Right? Name me what's a low stakes issue. Arts is high stakes for some, but yes, low stakes for the majority. What else is a low stakes issue? And the first thing I should notice is this. Uh, when we began to ask across, there actually are very few low stakes issues in Singapore. The nature itself of our country is that we have been born out of this whole vulnerability narrative, right? Basically the you're screwed narrative, right? You're small, you're vulnerable, you're gonna get squashed, right? You're gonna get attacks, right? You're gonna get eaten, you're gonna get <laughs> things over there. And if you really look at actually all these particular stories right, around that, it's come to a place where it has created a very high stakes environment for us. The other state which you're looking at over here, or axis, is between distance and closeness. Right? There are certain emotions right, that we handle alone, and there are certain emotions which we handle together. Right? And doing so over here, right, between distance and closeness, right, what this plays out in the Singapore context looks like this. Whether there's a common space, right, whether it's established by escape, or whatever the case of that, or whether there's a lack of common space. Right. And you'll find over here right, that um, if there's one strategy, and later on you'll see why, that is really crucial for Singapore, is to start building up this stuff. Right there. We have attempted right, to build up this particular stuff, right, essentially through void decks. Right. We have tried to. But you'll find over here that many of the void decks actually are quite empty. In a country itself, right, where the government is a key landowner around the whole places, very few of us actually right, have public spaces in which we go to. And we try our best as well, right, to open up your waterways, your parkways, and parks, I think, is doing a pretty good job around that. Right? But notice, uh, in the common spaces, many of them uh, are recreational in nature. Right? And in common spaces, how many common spaces do we have for discourse, for conversation, right? for identity forming, for vulnerability? And if I'm not wrong, they're next to none. Name me one space, right, a public civic space, outside of a religious organisation, Right, where you can go to for vulnerability. And let's try this in uh, understanding of Lee Kuan Yew's passing. Right. When Lee Kuan Yew first ruled Singapore, right, there was a strong um, assessment or accusation of a dictatorship. Right. And we heard itself that he was a very hard man right, and he ruled with the iron fist. We will take care of space, we will decide how to allocate, we will make the authority decisions, you just sit down there and you just do whatever you're going to do with it. And if you don't do, right, you're going to repent or regret it. And in doing so over here, right, this served Singapore for a pretty long time. What happened is right, roughly at the turn of the century, around 2000, right, was the internet was invented. The lack of common civic space right, was in Singapore for a very long time, but once the internet was invented, it shifted over to this particular space where suddenly there was shared common space. Right. And once it shifted there, right, Singapore began to swing from here boom, over to here. But what you find noticing in that space right, is that the stakes uh, were still all up there right, at the same time because we couldn't actually erase our vulnerability. Okay? Then that particular shift, what happened was that it came to a place where he passed on. And for a very temporary period right, at that point in time, right, there was a clear sadness because people could... Do you remember this? Um, he had yet to die, but he was slowly aging. And you could see itself right, from national day to national day, and they could feel that sadness growing, but there was no space to talk about it. It was not polite to do so. Right? But we knew that as a man like that, he was no longer a threat. Right? No longer a threat. And the sadness began to grow. Only on his passing did we give ourselves permission right, to create the common space right, to start to talk about it. 
And you find over here that showing of gratitude, right, of who he was as a person, right? I'm not sure whether everyone in the room right, was experiencing this, right? But I know basically whatever we saw, right, was not something that's orchestrated. No government, I don't know, no one planned for this. Everyone was surprised, right? And they wonder how on earth, right, did we get to that space? These are the core emotions right, of what Singaporeans experience. And I'll suggest you can take this and plot it right on every single local issue that we're going to go through. And every hard choice we experience, right, it will be there. Where are we generally on foreign workers? Anger. Because foreign workers share common space. Right? High stakes because they're taking away jobs, but you can't run from them. So there's anger, disgust, resentment, and these are all essentially self right within the same space. From an emotional realm, we're not saying that tenderness, therefore, is a better emotion than fear is. It's not. Right? Let me just quickly explain this. These emotions keep things out. Right? These emotions keep things out. So you'll find over here, like taking your pizza and putting it in your mouth, it keeps things out. Right? So it doesn't keep going to your mouth. Right? <laughs> this way. So you're doing this over here. That stuff right, is basically meant to protect you. Disgust, fear, anger. No! 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 It's out. Right? And there are some emotions that bring things in. Peace. Acceptance. Right? you'll find right, that generally the whole range of Singapore experience is either out or okay, come in. Empathy, compassion and leadership, these are the things that create common space for us. Okay? And the way that we lower stakes right, are essentially these words over here. I don't know if you guys remember this. I'm sorry, this is a spoiler. If you remember Inside Out, right, there was one particular movement over here right, where Joy uh, was actually lost all the way at the bottom of a, this dark that hole and she couldn't get up. And it was Bing Bong that came along, right? And Bing Bong had this little broom and I don't know what the song was, but Bing Bong, Bing Bong, Bing Bong, Bing Bong. And then Bing Bong over there, so, kind of things over there, and Bing Bong, she kept going up over here. But what that really was over here was that it was actually completely similar itself, right, to what the whole coaching field and counseling field do. And that at the darkest times of your life, the one key thing that will get you out is imagination. You have to be able to find a new story for yourself. If you cannot find a new story for yourself and you live that story down there, you can't get out. And it is imagination, creativity, innovation, the ability to say, I will dare dream another story for my life and believe it. That's what gets us out. Right? I mean, essentially, it's not just what Singapore did in 65. The scary thing, however, I think, about this particular whole chart is that I think a lot of this stuff is done for us by authority. And again, I say this, it takes away our character experience. It takes away our own abilities to begin to learn from this. Right? Because the hard choice must be navigated by citizens. It must be. The complexity of problems today cannot be handled by government alone. Sometime I think at the beginning of the year, I was asked to come in uh, for a meeting with uh, Honor Singapore. Right? And Honor Singapore had uh, asked me to go in among with other civil society leaders and were in that same room. And uh, Lim Chong Guan, who was like, one of these really early pioneers in Singapore, a highly respected man, was sharing his own brief of why he believed that honor was crucial for Singapore. And AWARE was there. This is AWARE the Women's Group. Right? And we were there. Uh, we were actually intrigued at why Lim Seung Guan felt that this was important. And what I said was this, I said, so I'm not sure whether um, this helps you, but I think I honour your work. And then Karina, who is president of the is going, huh, what do you mean by that? Well, I care for what you do. I don't agree always with what, how you do it, but I care for what you do. And I care for the fact because I've got three daughters, I have a wife whom I love very much. In fact, my whole life is surrounded by women who friends own me, right? 
And in doing so over here, right, I recognize the amount of pain that women can go through if they actually go through abuse. Right? Uh, because unfortunately, I'm on the other end where I counsel. Right? I do a lot of coaching myself right, with, with women there. And I've got very deep respect for what you do. And the thing about this, okay, you never know this, but every single time right, I craft my lectures or I write whatever, do I, whatever I'm doing, um, I always think of you. Because I know that you are part of my society. And I would ask, would Karina be upset if I wrote it this particular way? What exactly is honour? And honour is, is an understanding that we are constituted of one another. That we are constituted of one another. That what you do in your life actually contributes to the same world that I am living in. And because, right, notice the words I'm saying, user, because I respect the work that you do, right, I want a partnership with you to do the same work. And what a lot of civil society groups today are doing is saying, please, understand people's suffering. And if you understand it, understand that they are suffering for you in your space. And you should respect what they do. Right? But as a big move from that, it's not only must you respect what they do, but enter into a contract with them to do it together. But when you bring it to an emotional level, you might start understanding all is really connecting to what Hong Kong Ping said. Notice the words he uses. His whole lecture came to this place where he was talking about, you know, um, how do we move Singapore identity together? And he brought four key ideas. Right? He said, cohesive diversity, common space, collaborative governance, common space, info-rich civil society. Don't be distant info, have people have common information, common space. Find it, promise it, honour it. And I think that will be what makes Singapore exceptional. Right? And hopefully, my wish is that this becomes our, our identity.